just as you are to worship. Come, just as you are before your God. Come, one day. And one day every tongue will confess you are God. Worthy of every 
breath we could ever breathe. We live for you.
Would you just take a moment and just even with your own words, not a song, but with your own words, just give him worship. Would you give him praise? Give him honor. Thank him for something he's been doing in your life. Thank him for something he's provided. Thank him for a quality he possesses. Let's just take a moment and do that. Lord, we honor you right now. Do we 
give you praise today. We call on you today. And we thank you that you do hear your people when we call. And we just thank you for these moments of singing and worship. Pray your blessing over it. And each person here in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, amen, amen. It is so good to see you. Happy New Year's. Happy New, New Year's Eve day. And I tell you, you could be anywhere. You could be tired, right? You could say, oh, I don't want to be here. You are here. And I just want to say, great job. You're here today. And uh, this is what I'd like to do also is let's take a few moments. Let's greet each other. Maybe some people you haven't seen in a while or some people that are new to you. But let's take a few moments and spend some time greeting each other today. God bless you. Well, good morning again. Happy New Year. And uh, just a... a just a free New Year's joke. I have a quick New Year's joke. Uh, what is a corn's favorite holiday? New Year's Eve. Yeah. Yeah, there it is. I know. There it is. Okay. That's as good as it's going to get, folks, you know. Uh, but anyways, we, uh, we wish you a happy New Year. Um, if you are a guest today, we have these Connect cards that are in the uh, seat back in front of you. If you could grab those, if you could fill those out, bring them to our uh, guest services desk out in the lobby and uh, so that we can thank you. We would really appreciate it if you would do that. We're gonna receive this morning's tithe and offering and uh, let's pray as we, uh, as we worship together in this very tangible, very real way. Lord, thank you for the privilege it is to be a giver. Thank you for the privilege it is to reflect who you are, Jesus. You gave your life, you gave up everything. And so we follow you in that, and we just say, Lord, we want to give these gifts in honor of who you are as a symbol of our love and devotion to you, and I pray you just bless this uh, offering in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.
Thank you, worship team. Appreciate you guys. Hey, uh, bulletin, if you have one. Uh, it's actually uh, not a whole lot of things in the bulletin this week, but we've got some important things. Uh, first of all, last week we took our Fire Bible offering, and uh, you can read a little bit more about that in your bulletin. If for some reason you, know, you weren't here last week or you just would like to be able to give towards Fire Bible, you can still do that. You can give online. We have... Uh, for our giving buttons, we have a Fire Bible as one of them. You actually go there and give toward Fire Bible. So that's happening. Uh, also, our Wednesday night uh, Bible study and family fun activities, um, or fr family night activities, are resuming this Wednesday. And if you're a guest here today, let me just tell you, okay, and I have knowledge of this, uh, you will not find better Wednesday night kids programs and adult programs and you will hear praise assembly. We really have a tremendous offering for your kids, for you. And so I would, I would just encourage you, take advantage of these opportunities Wednesday night and uh, they will be a blessing, a help to your life. So those are resuming this Wednesday. And then it has our list of all the uh, back to basics. And how many know that the, every once in a while in your life, you need to go back to basics. You know, it's really about the, isn't it about the basic things on so many things? Reading, I mean, everything. It's, it's about basic things. And so here's our weekly topic list of what we'll be talking about in this coming year as uh, we focus on the basics. But Happy New Year. God bless you guys. Thank you, Pastor Hans. Well, today, kind of the last day of the holiday season, and I'm not sure where you are. If you're really here today, are you, are you out there? Are you, are you okay? Do we have to stand up and do a few jumping jacks? Maybe get the heart going a little bit? How many are, how many are just tired? Just raise your hand. Will you be that honest with you? You're just tired and exhausted. It's going to be great to go back to work on Tuesday, isn't it? Um, I heard some, some schools are open on Tuesday. They're starting back on Tuesday. Some are waiting until Wednesday. All the parents said, yay! But, you know, I was talking to the young adults today in Sunday school class, life group, and, um, well, was it there? I don't know. Anyways, I was talking to somebody recently this morning, because um, I was a teacher for a brief while, as Kathy and I were planting a church in New England, and, you know, you get Christmas off, and, you know, of course, the kids, I remember being a child, and you saw Christmas break coming to an end, that was so sad. That means you got to go back to school. You got to put up with the teachers again. You've got to study. You've got to read. You got to. The only thing worse is being a teacher because you don't want to go back either. Worse than the kids. It was worse than the kids. And uh, I have those memories. But now, if you're not a student and you're not a teacher, it, we need to get back to normal. And if you noticed in the, did you notice the bulletin? We had so much stuff going on, November and December, and literally I just <laughs> blew all the dust off, and you have a lot of white space on there now. Now, it doesn't mean that nothing's going on. As you can see, again, the schedule for Back to Basics is on there. We've got, we're going to continue in the, in the uh, Gospel of Mark on Wednesday nights, all of our kids' stuff. We're, we're always busy, but it's so good to get all of that stuff out of the way. We had a blast. Friday night was incredible with the inflatables. The food was good. Thank you for everybody that brought some good stuff to share. Um, but we are not going to eat again until the first weekend in March. Okay, so next week, these chairs are going to be replaced uh, with um, stationary bicycles for you. Because <laughs> we're all supposed to get healthy again now that we're in the new year and we're, we're done with eating for a while. I'm telling you, don't even think about bringing food in here. Uh, other than our ladies' breakfast and our men's breakfast. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it's done. I mean, I've, I've just carved up over the holidays, so I'm just surprised I don't look more like Santa. But um, anyways. Okay, let's get into today's message. And I really do. I'd appreciate if you'd stay awake. If not, I have a bottle of water in the front uh, row there I can use. So Happy New Year's. We're, I mean, we're only hours away from the start of a brand new year. And, you know, we are, I think really humans, we're eternal optimists. We really are. I mean, the calendar is going to change. Tonight, you're going to have a new calendar. Hopefully you got yours. We have them in the, in the lobby if you need one for 2024. I even like, I like even numbered years anyways, 2024. I get excited about all the old, you know, being put aside behind us and moving into something new, all kinds of new. We don't know what this year is going to hold. I mean, it could be a horrible year, but I'm, you know, I don't go into the year thinking that. 
I'm believing for great things. I'm believing for great things for the world, for our nation, for God's people. I really am. For you, this local church. But I want you to know in this, in this new year, next Sunday morning, we are, as Pastor Hans has already shared, we're going to try to get back to basics. Um, the three of us, Pastor Hans, Pastor Brand, and I have all, we, we set this thing in motion. We agreed a couple months ago that it was time for the church and our church and the church in general. Now, we, we have no, no influence on the church in general in the United States, but, but we really believe it's time to go back to the foundational elements of what the church is supposed to be. The Christian disciplines that will strengthen us and build us individually and, of course, into a stronger church family. And we're going to begin that emphasis, as you, as you heard, in full next Sunday morning. But my message for today is going to be meant more as an introduction to the concept that we're going to be presenting. Okay, you got a starting point, And I thought, let's do it December 31. We'll be all ready for next year. And I want to use a passage that I have preached from in the past. Came to my mind as soon as this emphasis was decided And it's found in Genesis chapter 26, and we're going to read verses 1 through 25, because I want you to have as full a context as you can before I single it down to just one verse. And so we're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 26, verse 1 through 25. Now, there was a famine in the land, besides the earlier famine of Abraham's time. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar. The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you to live. Stay in this land for a while, and I will be with you, and I will bless you. For to you and your descendants, I will give all these lands, and I will confirm the oath I swore to your father Abraham. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. And I will give them all these lands, and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed me and kept my requirements, my commands, my decrees, my laws. And so Isaac stayed in Gerar. And when the men of that place asked him about his wife, he said, she's my sister. Because he was afraid to say she's my wife. He thought the men of this place might kill me on account of Rebekah because she is beautiful. And when Isaac had been there a long time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked down from a window, saw Isaac caressing his wife, Rebekah. And so Abimelech summoned Isaac and said, she's really your wife. Why did you say she's my sister? And Isaac answered him, because I thought I might lose my life on account of her. And then Abimelech said, what is this you've done to us? One of the men might well have slept with your wife and you would have brought guilt upon us. So Abimelech gave orders to all the people, anyone who molests this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Isaac planted crops in that land and the same year reaped a hundredfold because the Lord blessed him. The man became rich and his wealth continued to grow until he became very wealthy. He had so many flocks and herds and servants, the Philistines envied him. So all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the time of his father Abraham, the Philistines stopped up filling them with earth. Then Abimelech said to Isaac, move away from us. You become too powerful for us. So Isaac moved away from there and encamped in the valley of Gerar and settled there. Isaac reopened the wells that had been dug in the time of his father Abraham, which the Philistines had stopped up after Abraham died. And he gave them the same names his father had given them. Isaac's servants dug in the valley and discovered a well of fresh water there. But the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen and said, the water is ours. So he named the well Esek because they disputed with him. Then they dug another well, but they quarreled over that one also, so he named it Sitna. He moved on from there and dug another well, and no one quarreled over it. He named it Rehoboth, saying, Now the Lord has given us room, and we will flourish in the land. From there he went up to Beersheba, and that night the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bless you. I will increase the number of your descendants for the sake of my servant Abraham. Isaac built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord. There he pitched his tent, and there his servants dug a well. 
Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this instance, this recorded instance. And I pray, Lord, that we would glean as much as we can out of this this morning, that, it would, that we'd find application for it in our lives, that your Holy Spirit would make it real, that we would know that your Holy Spirit is telling us that this is pertinent to us, that this fits the church today. Pray for your anointing, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the verse that stood out to me out of all those, and it, it became the catalyst for formulating this message for today, is verse 18. I want you to look at it again. Genesis 26, verse 18. Isaac reopened the wells that had been dug in the time of his father Abraham, which the Philistines had stopped up after Abraham died. And he gave them the same names his father had given them. Isaac reopened the wells. He reopened the old wells that had served his father so faithfully. And I sincerely hope, and I do pray that my message today will resonate with you, that you'll agree with me that there's a need to get back to the basics, the basics of, of raw Christianity. Because you see, I firmly believe that much of the church world, the, the, the church today, the modern church across our nation at least, has drifted. They, they've gotten off center. They've gotten off task. Many churches today, and actually I should say pastors today, because they're leading their churches this way, but many pastors today in a hunger to create new ways of doing ministry and their desire to appear more relevant to the unsaved world around us has often sought after new methods and at times even a new message and therefore could be in danger of compromising the age-old truths of God's word and even the gospel itself. We all know people like new things. I mean, new things appeal. We all like things that are novel. We like things to be freshened up from time to time. Some of you may have plans personally. I mean, maybe you want to refresh your life on January 1 and get a gym membership. Or you might decide to start renovating parts of your home. Or you might be looking at a new career. We all, we all do that. We, we love the idea of newness and refreshing. But we also have to admit that it's the old things. It is the old, dependable, <clears throat> consistent, faithful, the always stable things in life that sustain us. Because they're tried and proven. They've survived the droughts. They've survived the times of famine. And, and I'm sure that, you know, even during this Christmas season, many of you practiced long-held family traditions. We all have them. Possibly you go out to your favorite tree farm to pick out a Christmas tree and you bring your own saw and cut it down and strap it to the roof of your car, all that. So, I mean, that's, that, that was our tradition for a long time. And then I discovered how easy it was to just take a tree out of the box in the basement. Really, pre, I mean, pre-lit. No critters in there. I mean, nothing, no mold spores blowing through my furnace and or maybe you have, you have, a, you have a tradition of, of a special cookie or a special dessert that's always made and usually only at Christmas time. In fact, for Christmas, Christmas Eve, I got a couple good-sized bags of, of Chin Chin from Shadi Ojo. Oh my gosh, I'm so glad. I forget about it all year. When it's gone, I forget about it. Because a constant diet of that, again, I would look like Santa by now. It is so good. But that's once a year. And, I, and she said, would you like it? I said, no, no, just only do it once a year. But we relish these old things. They make us feel secure. They make us feel comfortable. And hear me on this. Without a doubt, sometimes the old and seemingly boring things are the more valuable things. Amen? They are. And this is what we're going to emphasize over the next few weeks. If you look at that schedule that's in the bulletin, Bible reading. Wow. Prayer. I mean, guys, it's nothing new, nothing profound. But sometimes we walk away from the truly valuable things. We forget all about them. We forget that they have to be the foundation of our Christian walk. I mean, our, our, our faith walk, our walk in God. And that's what we want, we want to emphasize that over the next several weeks. I believe there are a handful of core values and disciplines that Christians need to prioritize in their lives in order for all of us together to make a difference in our world. That's why we're here. That's, that's why Jesus has not come back for us yet, because our job isn't done. And for us to do our job, we've got to have these foundational issues settled. 
You know, churches today, I look, I look at churches, and, and some of you might go visit other churches. I try now and then, and I, I kind of have a pulse of what's going on out there around us. And, and some churches I found, they get really deep into events. I mean, it's one major event after another major event. Uh, their outreaches, they're, they're, event, they're, they're, they're event focused. And, and I want our church to be process focused. I want you to, I'd rather have a church that knows the importance of coming to life group every Sunday morning. And, and in a small group, those are small groups, by the way where you can discuss the Bible. It isn't monologue like this. I believe that's how you build a church, not by events, having a concert, having a big feed, having an outreach of some kind. I, I, don't, I don't feel like that's how you really reach people. You don't build a relationship with, those kind, with people like that. And I feel like these churches, by trying to be so relevant and trying to be event-focused, are missing the mark. They're missing their God-given mission. In many churches, there's a lot of activity, but not much in the way of results. Effectiveness has been replaced with novelty. So let me give you a list of the basics that we believe are important, and they're already listed for you. And again, even with the dates that we, we propose to, to speak about these issues, um, we've got Bible reading, prayer, fellowship, giving, giving, witnessing, worshiping, and discipleship. And all of these have been central to Jesus' instruction to his disciples. And, and they, they're also, they're basic to us today. And week by week, you're going to see why as we unfold this, you're going to get a better understanding of why we need to be engaged in these practices, these very basic disciplines. And obviously, there's so much to cover, you know, in the chapter we read here. I'm not, I, I could take this chapter and probably break it out into three or four weeks of, 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 of messages. But what I want to do is get right down to the basics next week. And so here's what I want to do this morning. I'm going to very quickly and concisely feature two substantial issues from this passage. And then I'm going to further concentrate. I'm going to target and focus on one other issue after those first two that should be of supreme concern to each one of us today. Now, the first two I want to mention to you are found in the first 10 verses. In, in these first three paragraphs that we looked at, we see that there's a famine in the land. And notice God's direction to Isaac concerning this difficult time. God directly speaks to, to Isaac, specifically speaks to Isaac, and tells him not to react to the famine. To not worry about it. Don't react to it. Don't react in the natural. God tells him specifically, do not go to Egypt. Do not. Under no circumstances, do not go to Egypt, but stay in Gerar. And for what it's worth, because you may not know this, Gerar is just about on the northern border of Egypt. It's as far south in Palestine as you can go before you hit the Egyptian border. So in essence, Isaac can probably see Egypt from where he is. He's that close. But God says, don't cross that border. And here's what I want you to understand. Egypt at that time, as well as most of its history, represents prosperity. Egypt represents worldly and temporal blessing and prosperity. Primarily because there's a well-known river that runs through it. It's called the Nile River. It runs through that nation. It would flood once a year. It would replenish the soil with all kinds of nutrients. And they, they had the, the, the most abundant supply of fruit and vegetables that you could possibly have. In the midst of the, de of the desert, there was abundance in Egypt. Egypt signifies wealth, prosperity. Success. But understand, along with that worldly abundance comes bondage. And Egypt as a place represents bondage. It'll be a place of captivity and slavery for the Jews. Not yet, but it's going to be. From which Moses, uh, God will raise up a deliverer by the name of Moses to set his people free. It's all in the next book of the Bible, in the, in the, in the book of Exodus. But at this specific moment in time, Egypt signifies bondage. Again, bondage to material things and bondage to, to prosperity. Now, some of you are probably thinking, boy, I wouldn't mind being in bondage to prosperity. I'd, lo I'd love to be captivated. I'd love to be captured by wealth and success. Still a bad thing. To, to be in bondage to anything. To be, to, be in, to be a slave to anything but Christ is wrong. And so Egypt represents bondage to everything that could be worldly. So to run to Egypt during this time of need, and there's a, there's a genuine, 
Isaac has a genuine need and God says, don't go to Egypt. That would be running to natural supply. And you know, God doesn't want us to run to natural supply. He wants us to run to him. Supernatural supply. And what God has specifically told Isaac in these verses is to stay in the promised land and allow me to provide for you. And someday all this land will be yours. And all the multitudes of people that I promised your father will be yours. That's what God's telling Isaac. So again, beware of bondage. Beware of Egypt. Now, I want to also add that God in the process of providing for Isaac, this is interesting, even, even providing for us today, he doesn't just send manna from heaven. That, that's one way of providing. He, but, but God doesn't only supply our temporal needs. Again, he is Jehovah Jireh. He will supply your need. But you know, he also gives us something much more important than temporal things. And I hope you truly value this heading into a brand new year. God supplies us as no one else can, God will supply us with direction. Isn't it great? Isn't it great where you know where you're going, where you know that God is leading? You're actually following someone who knows everything about everything over all time. God has no, he has no restrictions. He knows every single event for every human being in the world from now until the end of time. Unbelievable. We want that kind of direction. And so you see, God can direct us through circumstance. He can direct us through his word, even by speaking to us personally, as he has done here in this chapter with Isaac. God has spoken to Isaac and given him direct instruction. Do not go to Egypt. Stay in Gerar. And the purpose of that mandate overall is that God wants us to know that he has a plan for our lives. And he's guardian over our lives. He knows when a sparrow drops to the ground. And how much more, import- how much more valuable are we than a sparrow. So listen to me. We're not left to ourselves. You understand? We are not orphans in this world. You you can act like an orphan. You can go ahead and distance yourself from the Father. But we actually have a Heavenly Father who genuinely cares for us. I I, I want you to feel that today. I, I can try to convince you, but I really hope that this week you'll feel that. So at this point, Isaac, he is sensitive to the will of God. He's obedient to the will of God and he chooses to believe the promises of God. And so he stays in Gerar. Now, second thing I want you to see here in these verses at these, these Hebrew men, Abraham and Isaac, they, they did have somewhat of a problem with integrity. Uh, look at verse seven again, if you can. Isaac, just like his father, Abraham, lies about his wife. I'm telling you, when I, when I think about this instance, Sarah and Rebecca must have been absolutely drop-dead gorgeous. I mean, there's no other way to explain it. I mean, Isaac did admit that. They, they must have been incredibly desirable. And remember now that Abraham had lied to Pharaoh about Sarah, said she's my sister. Then he also had lied to Abraham. I mean, Abraham had also lied about uh, Sarah not being his wife to Abimelech. He did, it, he did it with Pharaoh once. He did it with Abimelech once. And now Isaac, Abraham's son, is also lying to Abimelech. And my problem here is not their cowardice or their fear. I probably would have done the same thing. You know, what good is it if they kill me and take her? Or if I stay alive and they take her? I know it sounds awful selfish. It does sound like, you know, I mean, guys, the men in this place, you can judge your own hearts. But I, I can't, I'm not going to point a finger at them. But my problem here is really the immorality of it all. That's really the problem. And the embarrassment that each man brought upon himself. See, there'd be a price for that. I mean, to think that a pagan king, Abimelech, a Philistine, a pagan king has to explain to a God-fearing Jew that it would have been sinful if someone had accidentally slept with his wife. Isn't that, isn't that unbelievable? A pagan king has to remind a God-fearing Jew. I mean, this is, and, and, this, and Abimelech is offended. He's offended that Isaac could have possibly caused, caused any one of his people to have committed adultery and completely with no knowledge, totally un, un, unintentionally. And, and you know what I wonder? I wonder if we, the church, are in that same condition today, and I'll explain here. 
Not that the world standards are higher than ours. They're not. The world that we live in is in very sad shape. And it's going down fast. But could we be guilty? Listen to me. Could we be guilty of lowering our standards? Could we be guilty today of being careless in the area of personal holiness to the point where the world today is justified in pointing a finger at the church, at the people of God? I mean, and with valid accusations. Is the unsafe world today justified in their criticism against a hypocritical church? You know, just think about it anyway. I don't need you to respond, but just think about it. Because some of the things that Christians are involved in today, they no longer shock or repulse church people anymore. That's, that, I want to start there. The Bible says, you know, let judgment, let judgment begin, but let it begin first at the household of God. Okay, so we need to look at ourselves. I'm not going to judge the world. God's going to judge the world. But we need to look at ourselves. But could it be that we're, we're doing things that are similar to the world and they don't shock us anymore? And, and in too many ways, the church doesn't stand out enough in contrast to, to the world like we used to. And so the average non-Christian, I wonder if the average non-Christian thinks to themselves, what's the difference? What, what, what's the difference between the way that I live as a heathen and the way those Christians live? What's the difference? And I got a couple, couple of definite concerns in this matter. First is, is I wonder if the prophet Jeremiah could be speaking to us today when he says this, and he, hundreds of years ago, in Jeremiah 6.15, he said, are they ashamed of their loathsome conduct? No, they have no shame at all. And he's talking about the people of God. No, they have no shame at all. They don't even know how to blush. What a scathing rebuke. They don't even know how to blush. Never mind Repent. And so I really wonder if Christians today ever feel embarrassed about their behavior before the unsaved. There truly seems to be very little distinction today between the saved and the unsaved, except we're trusting God for, for eternal life. The other concern I have is related to what Jesus said about us being salt and light. And he tells us that there's supposed to be a noticeable difference between his church and the world. There should be a difference. And I don't mean us gathered here together. I mean you in the workplace. You in your school, you in your neighborhood, you among your family. There ought to be something that they know that you're just, dis- and I know we try to identify, I know we really want to be, we don't want to be too separated from people that we have no relevance, that we can't reach them. But you know, I still think the world is looking for there to be a difference. There's got to be a reason for them to want to leave where they are and to go to where you are. It's got to be something that would entice them, something that's better And believe it or not, what Jesus says here, it's a diagnosis of why the church isn't as effective as it could be today. I really believe that. And he states this in a form of a question. He says, what good is salt if it's not salty? Except to be thrown outside the door and trampled on. What good is it? If it has no saltiness, what good is it? That makes sense, right? I mean, and so one has to wonder, is the church being trampled on today? Have we lost the respect that we once had and maybe even gain the resentment of the world. Because not only is the world looking at us to be different, I think there are certain people who don't know Christ yet. Again, they're in the world. I think some of them are hoping that there's something better. And if they don't see it in us, where else can they look? We're it. We are. And you've heard this many times. I remember um, Charles Spurgeon said this hundreds of years ago and uh, there was a famous uh, megachurch pastor who said this and every time they start up their church service that we are the hope of the world. We're all they have. We, we're the body of Christ. We're the body of Christ. We're the bride of Christ. What can they hope in if they don't see something different in us? That, that, I'm not trying to scold you or shame you at all. I don't want you to feel any guilt over this, but just questioning like, why aren't we being more effective? And I think the world has lost respect for the church because our standards have become the same as theirs. That's all. So look at Genesis 26, verse 10 again. Look at Abimelech's concern about sin and guilt. And then look at Abimelech's admonition and exhortation to Isaac. Abimelech, in this passage, actually shames Isaac. Verse 10. Then Abimelech said, What is this you've done to us? One of the men might well have slept with your wife, and you would have brought guilt upon us. You would have made us sin. and Unbelievable. Doesn't his concern, I mean, he's a, I'm just saying, he's pagan, he's heathen. He doesn't know, 
Doesn't his concern seem rather odd to you? A pagan king concerned about sin. And yet it, it, it should have occurred to Isaac first. And, and sin should be an issue with us first. And, and so I believe that it's time for the church to raise the bar in the areas that concern our personal holiness. And that means getting back to basics. I don't, th- I don't know that we can feel conviction. I don't know that we can get direction. I don't know that we really can know Christian values unless we are reading the word, unless we're praying, unless we're doing the very basic things in the Christian walk. And so starting next week, we're going to be looking at going back to basics. And finally, my third issue for this morning Following Isaac's rebuke from Abimelech, something extraordinary happens. Abimelech, again, after scolding him, Abimelech orders Isaac to move away. Just go away. Okay? You could have caused us to sin. Just go. And immediately as part of the move, Isaac realizes that he has a need. He has a need for water. As we read, his, he and his clan have gotten quite large. His wealth is renowned. His flocks are vast. And like any ancient Palestinian, Isaac understood the crucial importance of a reliable source of water. All it takes in that environment is one long day in the sun, and you quickly realize how important that commodity really is. And believe it or not, Isaac's search for water has application for us today. And that, of course, is why I'm bringing it up right now as part of this message. Because you see, water in the Bible is always a source of sustenance and supply. It's always a symbol of life and energy, more so than food. I mean, obviously, without, you, can, you can go quite a long time without food, but water, you know, you've got to have water more, more often. And of course, without water, you can't even grow produce, agriculture. So physically, we all need water. And as Christians, we, sh- we need to be aware that we need to have a spiritual flow in our lives. Every one of us needs a spiritual flow of life-giving sustenance for ourselves and for those around us. And the Bible usually speaks of this supply and strength coming to us in the form of the Holy Spirit. I'll give you an example. Um, and you see this both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the first reference I want to show you is from uh, the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit moving like a river. It's interesting. The Bible really talks about the Holy Spirit with with the characteristics of flowing like a river. And in Ezekiel chapter 47, the prophet tells a powerful story of a vision that he had of water flowing out from under the threshold of the temple. I mean, it's just the water is just trickling out from under the door, just just over the threshold, just a small trickle. And if you you read the story, you got to look at Ezekiel chapter 47. Look at it later. So over time, it grew grew bigger and got up to his ankles. Then it got up to his knees and it got up to his hips. The water kept increasing in size and in power. And it wasn't just its size and its flow and its its power that was important, but it also provided nourishment. Began as a small trickle. Became this raging tidewater. And it says in Ezekiel that that it brought new life to the plants and the fruit trees throughout the desert. It provided for large netfuls of fish. And one verse in particular sums it all up so wonderfully. And it says this. So where the river flowed. Now, again, this is a small trickle. It becomes a river, a mighty river. He says, so where the river flows, everything shall live. Where the river flows, everything shall live. Where the river of the Holy Spirit flows, everything really lives. That's an Old Testament prophet predicting that that would happen. And you know what? When the Holy Spirit flows in full force without boundaries, you know, no bank, rivers have banks and sometimes they overflow. When the Holy Spirit overflows like that, he brings life and power wherever he lands. I mean, it's unbelievable. The Spirit brings life and power wherever it flows. It's the story of Pentecost in the book of Acts. The Holy Spirit came upon 120 people in a room meeting somewhat out of fear. And in just one day, as a result of the Holy Spirit flowing out of that room, 3,000 other lives are forever changed. 
3,000 people were born again, ready for heaven because of what the Holy Spirit did that day. It wasn't Peter's sermon. Peter's sermon was so brief. You can read it. It's just a couple of verses. And they ask, what must we do to be saved? And he tells them to repent. But it was the Holy Spirit that did this. And also in the New Testament, prior to the day of Pentecost, Jesus himself predicted that there'd be rivers of living water flowing out from every one of his disciples. He meant those 12 that were around him. He means us too. The Holy Spirit in us, flowing out to others, will bring nourishment and sustenance. It is for us, but it's not just for us. There ought to be an overflow. Listen, I want you to hear exactly what he said. This is John 7, verse 37. On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and he said in a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, whoever believes in me, as the scriptures have said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this, he meant the Holy Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. They hadn't received it yet. Up to that time, the Spirit had not yet been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. And so what began on the day of Pentecost is still available for everybody today. You see, the waters of the Old Testament are a type of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. And just as Isaac knew the importance and necessity of water for his family, for his flocks to stay alive, we too today need to see, we need to see our need for a flow of the Holy Spirit. Now look at me at what Isaac does. Back in Genesis chapter 26. We read that the first thing that he did as he seeks this life-giving flow is to reopen the wells of his father Abraham. You see, over time, the Philistines had stopped up those wells. And of course, the Philistines represent the enemy. You understand that? And I want you to know that your enemy, Satan, has been working in your life and mine to stop up and fill in the wells that we were meant to tap into. It really has. It just, it just happens over time. And I believe that much of the church today is not anywhere as vibrant and as strong as it could be simply because we've been drinking out of mud puddles instead of tapping into the full power of the Spirit's headstream. It's that simple. I believe we need to do the same thing that Isaac did. I believe we need to redig the old wells. And it's for that reason, I believe that we need to do what Isaac was called to do. I believe that we need to reopen some of the wells of our Pentecostal fathers, like maybe the well of Bible reading. That's next Sunday. I mean, it doesn't doesn't sound exciting, but you should see the passages that speak about the power of God's word. I mean, the power of God's word, the things that we can do with God's word, the things that God's word will do inside of us. You know, God's word shouldn't just be some dusty old Bible up on a shelf or on a coffee table. The word of God, the word of God is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. You know that verse? Able to cut sinew and bone and, I mean, to, to, to go into the soul of a human being. The word of God is powerful. Isaiah said it'll never return void. It'll go out and it'll do exactly what it was meant to do. It's going to do God's will before it comes back. I mean, the word, and so, and I don't want to take everything away from Pastor Hans next week, but Bible reading. And again, I, I really pray, guys, we want these messages to be exciting because they're old topics. They're old, dusty topics. And I really think a lot of Christians have forgot how important they are. Bible reading. The next week I'll be teaching about prayer. And again, there's so many, there's so many people have misconstrued prayer, made it so hard. I mean, I don't think prayer has to be that hard. Some people have made it so mystical that only, only certain people can really pray and expect something. So I want to I get rid of that myth on January 14. And then Christian disciplines and faith and evangelism, and, and we'll go through that whole series. And again, we're going to share those messages each and every Sunday in the new year. Because I want to encourage you to tap into the old wells. We're going to tap into the old wells. That's where we begin. That's where Isaac began. The wells had supplied for Abraham. They'd never failed. And they did the same for him. The enemy filled them in. Isaac dug them out. And after Isaac reopened the old wells, and we read this, Genesis 26, 25, He dug some new wells. They were contested, and he kept moving, kept digging more wells. Finally found one, 
And it says in the very end, last verse, Isaac built an altar just like his father used to do all the time. And then he dug a new well. He reopened the old ones first. And then he dug a new well. And what that tells me is that not only should we reopen the old wells, but it's okay for us to dig some new ones. Just not man's methodology, not changing the message. We should dig new ones and give the Holy Spirit even more freedom in our life. That's what the new wells represent. Going back to the basics, going back to get sustenance, get nourishment, get strength from the Holy Spirit through the old wells, and then dig new ones so that we can have even more. Next week, again, Pastor Hans will share on the need for us to read God's word regularly. And so um, when he came in this morning, there was a sheet of paper on your seat. And um, very simply, it'd be great, if you haven't done this in a while, to read through the Bible in a year. It's, it's really a challenge. I, I, I somewhat don't like this method because it encourages you to speed read and not comprehend. But the thing is, eat, you know, when, you, when you're taking in God's word, it's just like eating. I just don't eat fast. <laughs> Some of you like fast food. This is going to be fast food, but it's still going to have nourishment. It's still going to have nourishment. And so you can use this. You can follow this schematic, this strategy for the year. But I'm giving it to you now because if we hand it out next week on the 7th, you know how far you, you'd be so far behind. So you can start this tomorrow. You can try to start it tomorrow and then probably fail and then you'll be up all night reading the ones you missed. And oh, it's frustrating. I've been through this where you read through the whole Bible in a whole year. It's tough. But there's another way you can do this. Can we have the, the graphic? Um, you version. You can do what They have all kinds of Bible reading programs where maybe you don't do the whole Bible in a year, but maybe you just go through the Psalms. Maybe you go through Proverbs. You can do, get into the Word. Get into the Word. That's all I want you to do. So you can use, you can go old school, you can do you version, and also you can, you know what, you can listen to it. Remember, we used to do this. Remember the deep, well, there were cassettes. Remember in the old days, in January, December, January, you guys would buy these cases of cassettes and pop them. In, how many remember what a cassette is? And you'd pop them in your car and you could just listen to the word of God driving to work. That's wasted time. And then, you remember Hosanna Integrity? They're the ones that kicked these out. Then they went to DVDs. So we had to spend more money to listen to God's word in the car. Now you can do it for free with an MP3 player and your Bluetooth in your car. If your car is pre-1985, I guess you're out of luck. But, you know, but maybe if you listen to the word of God, you'll prosper and he'll get you a new car. Um, no, that's, that, that, see, that's what the other pastors do. I'm just teasing, okay? So listen, you can go old school, you can find a Bible reading program in version, or you can even just listen to it, because version will, it'll play it out for you. You don't have to read. As I already quoted from Isaiah, his word will not return empty. It will not return void. It will accomplish what God desires. His word will accomplish what God desires and fulfill the purpose for which it was sent. So plan to get into the word tomorrow as you start this new year. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, I pray right now, Lord, that you would, God, that you would just tremendously bless your church in the United States of America. Lord, we, we see the things that are going on worldwide with great revivals, great harvests in so many parts of the world, in Asia and in Africa, where it just hasn't slowed down for, for, for over a decade and more. And Lord, we pray that something happened here in our own nation, God, we're, we're sending missionaries around the world. And now some of those countries are sending missionaries to the United States. But Lord, I thank you that we don't, we don't need to have missionaries. We just simply need to get back to the basics. To do the things that we're supposed to be doing. We know enough every, every day or every morning or every evening to shower. We know enough to eat some normal meals during the day. We, we know enough to do the basics of life. And I pray, God, that we, would, that we care about our spirit man and make sure that our spirit man is properly cared for. Lord, I pray, God, that through this series that, that we would find so, just, just tremendous application and be doers of the word and not hearers only. Lord, I thank you for this direction that you've given us. And Lord, I just pray your blessing again on your church, that your church would rise up, be strengthened by the power of your Holy Spirit, by the strength of your word, 
to do what we've been called to do. And that is to lead people into a life, an eternal life with Jesus Christ to be their Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. Lord, I just thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for the turning of a calendar this evening and tomorrow. And and once again, Lord, I pray your blessing, spiritual blessing for us. And I pray your blessing now in each one of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless and happy new year.